Good afternoon, George. Hi. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for saying yes, being on uh, Michelle's Conversations That Matter. Um, I'm so fortunate to know you through a mutual friend. We were introduced um, and I've been I've been following you and uh, witnessing all of your great activity. You're, you're truly inspirational uh, with all the information that you share on social media. And you're constantly like, like um, being authentic. The thing I love about you is you're always like, you're, you're throwing up like live videos about what's going on. You're very real about the good and the bad. And I think that that, it makes you incredibly relatable. So I was super stoked when you were like, yes, I'll, I'll join you. Um, so today we're going to have a chat a little bit about uh, the impact that COVID has had on entrepreneurs or solopreneurs, um, you know, because a lot of businesses are suffering given, you know, COVID is, has come and impacted us. Um, and, you know, one of the things before we get into the questions and I start and, and I begin, I wanted to highlight this this belief that I've always known in my mind around having multiple streams of income. It's always been something that I feel like I've known to do, but it wasn't until I actually lost my corporate job and started to realize how important it is to have multiple streams of income. It's funny because as I was doing research, it said that um, if you have several sources of income, you're gonna be able to get closer to becoming financially independent and then I found that the average millionaire has seven different streams of income. And that just, you know, it made sense to me. So, so let's kick it off by you introducing yourself to, to the audience, who you are, where you live, what you do. So, yeah. So my name is George Kefalos. Everybody calls me GK, which is my initials. Um, I live here in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I've been a resident of PA for most of my life. I mean, I've lived in England and Greece, but this is where I've uh, grown up mostly in America. Uh, I started out, uh, I, I guess you would say my career started out as a landscaper. I had a lawn business back when I was in my early 20s. And how I started that was I was uh, working as a personal trainer and I got certified as a personal trainer and I got into an argument with the owner of the gym. And while we were arguing, I asked him, I said, you know, Saturday I'm going down to Washington DP to get certified. You know, what is my new pay going to be? And he said, well, you're going to get a dollar raise. And I was assuming without asking him that because I got certified, I was gonna get all this money. And I thought to myself, a dollar raise. At the time, I think minimum wage or whatever I was getting was like $7. So he was gonna bump me to eight. And I remember quitting on the spot because I just thought I had more value than $8 an hour. I had a hard time having somebody give me a price that what I was worth. Um, I, try, I was delivering pizzas to make extra money. I actually even went to a, a private investigation academy. I became a private investigator at 22, 23 years old. But I remember thinking like, I don't think I really want to spy on people my entire life. This is not really what I want to do. But so I was young. I was trying to find my way, and I, I got into landscaping. And the way I got into that was my mom had a lot of books. I used to make fun of her for having so many books, and now I have so many books. It's crazy how that works. But she had a book. It said the top 100 businesses in America to start. And I was going through them at like 23 years old. I remember thinking, like, I, I don't have the money. I don't have the money. I don't have the money. I don't have the brains. I don't have the brains. And then I was like, wait a minute, lawn care? wow, you can make almost six figures doing lawn care. So my mom gave me a, a little loan. I went down to the local Sears. I had a Suzuki Samurai Jeep. So I had to buy a little lawnmower that folded down and I had everything across the passenger side. And I went down to Staples and I printed out like 2000 neon green flyers. It just said, reliable, reasonable rates, call me. And I got my first call and I, I charged him $20 to cut his lawn. It took me about an hour. And I remember thinking, man, I was making seven dollars an hour now i'm making 20 and i'm my own business owner and that's where i got my start <laughs> well what happened with that though is you know it was very hard for me to find people that were motivated about my business the way i was motivated about it so having to find employees was difficult and i also had hit like a, a glass ceiling where i couldn't get through it because i could only do so many lawns a week and i also started to look at people that were doing lawn care longer you know i'm always the kind of guy like when i'm doing something I want to see like, you know, what, like I always tell people all the time, like, are you happy with the, the money that somebody working for the same company as you five years longer is making? And they usually say no. Well, think about that. Like, if you're not happy with the person who's been working there five years longer, where are you going to be in five years? So I remember looking around and thinking, man, a lot of these guys that are doing lawn care are like still doing it in their 60s and 70s. And when I talk to them, they have like no health insurance or no benefits or no retirement fund. Uh, their truck is not brand new. Uh, they've been weathered physically from all the moose and the sun. And 
I remember thinking, well, that's going to be me and I got to find a different way. So I went on to um, my mom actually ended up firing her uh, manager for like theft. And I ended up taking over my mom's day spa as a manager. And I thought, this is amazing. I got a corporate job. I kept the lawn business. Now I had two streams of income. The lawns I kept, what I did was I downsized to like my favorite 10 uh, lawn customers. They were like elderly. I just didn't want to leave them because they loved me and I loved them. So I kept them for Friday, Saturdays, and I worked for my mom full time. Uh, and that was exciting until I realized, okay, well, there's only so much money I can make here. Yeah. Uh, I only work so many hours a week. I have a salary. I mean, I, I created a children's uh, spa for her. I created a couple's retreat room, a hair salon. But no matter how much I put into it, I couldn't make any more money. And, you know, when I would say to my mom, Let's try this, this. There's this new thing called Amazon. Why don't we try to put products on there or uh, eBay? Or and she would say, No, no, no. And there's this thing called Facebook. She goes, No, that's 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 weird. Facebook. What is Facebook? And um, her, you know, her philosophy. And nothing against my mom. She's amazing. I mean, she was very successful. She taught me a lot. But her philosophy was, if it's not broke, don't fix it. My philosophy was, if it's not broke, why not make it better? So there was a, a conflict there. <clears throat> and eventually, I realized, like, okay, this is not working either. And to make matters worse, back in those days, there you had this show called MTV Cribs, and I used to watch this show, and I used to get so upset. Like it was like one of those like train wrecks. Like you don't want to watch the train wreck, but you want to look. So as much as I didn't want to see what these people were able to achieve, I had to look because it was exciting. And I'm thinking like, what do I have to do? And I didn't realize back then. You know, I kept thinking these guys are these people are lucky. They're so lucky, 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 lucky. But the reality is it wasn't luck. It was that they were putting themselves in situations to be able to be around that environment to grow. You know, uh, they I always say the negative state of a mind is um, negative. The, the, the natural state of a mind is negativity. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a garden. The natural state of a garden is weeds. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. to have a nice garden, you got to have make sure that you're purposely putting good soil in there. You're pulling out the weeds. I mean, I pull out weeds out of my backyard every week. If I don't, my entire yard's infested with weeds. So a lot of times. We get caught up in what we're doing with the people that we're doing it, and we don't see what it takes to get successful. So, mm -hmm. um, a chance in 2011, um, you know, I had been approached by a lot of network marketing companies, and I didn't really know much about it. Um, but there was one that came into the area, and it was uh, it was uh, dealing with energy deregulation. It was uh, dealing with uh, life essential services, and I remember looking at it and thinking, "This is like a no brainer. This makes sense. Like I'm not selling anything. I'm helping people save money." and uh, what do I have to lose? I mean, the worst case scenario, I fail. Um, where I'm at now, I'm not happy. So I took a chance and you know, obviously I did good for the first few months and then I hit a wall. And I remember thinking if my first instinct was quit, just quit, you know, you made a couple thousand dollars, just quit. But then I thought, you know what? Like if I keep quitting, I'm never gonna succeed. Like oh, I'm gonna continue to create this habit of quitting. So I went on this website, and I looked at all the top 50 money earners and I remember thinking like, there's nothing extraordinary about any of these people. Like they just look like everyday human beings. Like, so I started reaching out like, Hey, you know, what, how, did you have this situation? And they were all like, yeah, everything you're going through is part of the process to become successful. Like you develop into a stronger version of yourself, you know? And I always say you have to shed a lot of immature versions of yourself to become who you really want to be. So I stuck with it three weeks later, I had a breakthrough. Um, and then I was, I got, had some success. And then I remember being successful and going to this event and coming back and I was like, I have no more contacts. Like I ran out of contacts and I wanted to quit again. My mom's like, you know, are your friends from 10 years ago the same friends you have now? I'm like, no. Is your job the same? She's like, no. And she reminded me that the law of attraction, kind of like when you buy a car, mm -hmm. you say, hey, I'm drinking this water. I will now recognize everybody at the gym who's drinking this water because I'm drinking it. But those people were always drinking Fiji water. I just never thought about it because I wasn't drinking Fiji water. Right? It's not a commercial for Fiji anyway. <laughs> you better send me a check. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> the point is, you know, I started to open up and go, okay, well, maybe that guy, and that's how my best friend Eric got involved with me. I saw him in the gym every day, but I never thought about approaching him. And then one day I thought, well, maybe he he wants to make money, you know? And long story short, I ended up becoming a top money earner in network marketing. Mm -hmm. I remember I was making, I was in college you know, bringing in more money than my friends who were lawyers and doctors. But even at that moment, when I got a taste of like success, I remember I bought a brand new Lexus, a condo. I remember thinking, I can't put all my eggs in one basket. Like I left my job. I, left, I have not worked an actual nine to five since 2012. But I remember thinking like, what if this doesn't last forever? Right. You know, what is my backup plan? You know, everybody has like health insurance, dental insurance, car insurance, renter's insurance, you know, but they don't have, uh, you know, financial insurance. Right. And to me, I was like, well, where's my where's my safety net? So
So I remember reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and thinking, okay, real estate is the way to go because I had an uncle of mine who came from Greece and uh, he was very wealthy doing real estate. And my grandfather came over. Uh, most of my family went to Australia uh, from Greece, but they, my, uh, my grandfather and my great uncle came to America. They both came at the same time. They were both cooks. One went on to become like an, uh, 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 an oyster chef and get into real estate. And one ended up uh, doing bad choices and ended up being homeless. <laughs> it's amazing how they both came from Greece, one homeless, one rich. But I remember going to his house in West Orange, New Jersey as a kid and living there. And he had a big fridge and a TV and food in the fridge and like a pool. And I remember thinking, man, you know, this is amazing. And he was doing real estate. So I got into real estate. And uh, from there, I met more people. And it's kind of been like a journey, Michelle. You know, every, every opportunity that I take a control of leads me to more opportunities and more people. And that's why I always tell people like what Richard Branson said, you know, if somebody offers you an opportunity, say yes, and then figure out how to do it on the way yeah. there. Yes. So from there, um, I realized that I wanted to help my friends get into real estate. A lot of them had issues with credit, so I ended up buying a credit repair company. And then from there, I met Robert Herjavec from Shark Tank at an event. He inspired me to realize that I wasn't busy enough. Uh, we ended up opening a clothing brand called Evolve Apparel. And it's just one thing led to another. I ended up writing a book. Um, I ended up writing a second book. Uh, recently, about a year ago, I started a nutrition company. And there's been a lot of things that I've been involved in. And the, brain, the best of is I get to actually add a lot of value to people's lives. I get to I get to help my friends start right. businesses with me. Like every business, one of my friends is a business partner of mine, um, and it's just been a, a great run. And I'm excited, and uh, I get to really uh, do what I. Do. So that's I who it. I am in a nutshell. I love it. I love it. No, that's great. You you've covered a lot of uh, a lot of things already, and I I think it's remarkable. Um, your thirst for always wanting more, learning more and expanding. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, a lot of people, um, especially the small businesses of the world and the entrepreneurs, it really took a hit when COVID happened. And I know that you, um, you were telling me, I think on a conversation we had that like, you just had to sort of shift your focus. So what did you do? What, what did you realize when COVID hit that you needed so to do? So, I mean, I've definitely been hit. I mean, I'll go through every business with you so you can kind of get understanding. So in the network marketing business, um, you know, I was building a pretty massive team and all of a sudden we weren't able to do meetings. We weren't able to hold events. I mean, and, you know, in society, you have to show what you're doing. You have to create noise for people to be attracted to the noise. Then they feel like they're missing out or they realize that, hey, these are opportunities. Other people are doing it. So when you take away all the all that noise, out of mind, out of sight, people go back to like their normal everyday life and forget about their dreams. So I had to say to myself, okay, well, what can I do right now? I really can't do much in my network marketing business. So let me see if I can shift some gears. So I shifted gears to credit repair and I realized, okay, maybe not as many people can afford credit repair, but there are people out there who want to learn how to do credit repair, who want to learn how to actually have their own credit repair business. So we shifted gears and we put more attention into creating a university right now and uh, a class, a six week course where we teach people how to do credit repair. We had our first uh, class a few weeks ago. Now we're creating, like I said, the university. So it's been going really well. You know, we had 30 students who paid us $1,000 each for one weekend to teach them how to do credit repair. And then we give them one month of training and we've actually hired five people. So we took what we could do <clears throat> with credit repair and we took it to the next level. As far as when it came to like the housing market, right? Um, I was having some tenants, right? People that I uh, had to evict, I couldn't evict them because uh, they were, you know, and these are people that were still working and getting paid, but they were just milking the system. So wow. I started to look for properties in different areas. I said, you know, well, maybe I need to adapt, maybe, the market's too high right now. Let me maybe buy a property in a different city. Let me show that I'm interested in real estate. And what happened is I bought, I'm closing this week on three houses who um, are in a totally different area that I've never bought before. I am also, today, as of today, working on a deal from a wholesaler. I've never bought a house from a wholesaler. So what a wholesaler is, it's somebody who's purchased a home from a, a, a private, you know, a private, uh, the owner's a private sale, and then that person is selling it to me before closing. So I've never done that. So that that person got a great deal privately without it going on market, and now they're selling it to me within 30 days of them buying it. So I'm, I'm looking at different avenues of how to get property, but I'm out there looking. So I didn't just shut my doors. Now, as far as the clothing, we were our warehouse was shut down till mid-summer. All our events are canceled. There's no gyms that will allow us to set up. There's no bodybuilding bikini shows. I mean, we're flatlined when it comes to the clothes. So what did we do? 
Um, I took some, you know, um, I basically said to myself, you know, what, what did I do years ago that was successful that maybe I can bring back? And I thought, wow, you know, I used to have a skincare line back with my mom. So mm -hmm. I actually, and I haven't even announced this yet, um, but I have actually uh, gotten in touch with a Colorado company and we're actually coming out, our clothing brand is coming out with an Evolve CBD skincare line. We have a cleanser, a toner, a mask, I mean, a muscle rub. Um, and it's actually pretty much ready in about a week from now, we'll be ready. But we are so busy with other things that I said to Eric, let's just hold back on launching this because we have so much going on. I don't want to feel like you know, we're selling everything under the sun. But we, we revamped the clothing brand and say, you know what, let's be like Jeff Bezos. Let's not just sell books. Yeah. Let's open up and look at other opportunities. Yeah. Um, um, and, and with the nutrition brand, I mean, that's the one business that's actually done very well. But we realize, okay, we can't go to events. Mm -hmm. We can't go. So maybe we can focus on uh, hiring ambassadors. Maybe we can we can hire people to be part of our team and give them the ability to make money by them promoting our product. So it's just been adapting. And yeah, I mean, we're making some more money here, but we're losing some money here. But the pro the point is that we're still moving forward. Yeah. And we're we're not just sitting back, letting life happen to us. Like yeah, the door a couple doors closed, but we're searching for new doors. And mm -hmm. big believer that. The, 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 the action that we're taking now, the new people that are coming into our lives, it's all gonna come full circle in the next six months, a year, and we're gonna be like, wow, we're so glad we didn't sit back, because momentum takes time. See, like you can't even see momentum. It's a process that's very subtle. It's how the compound effect is. Like right now, if I ate a donut every day, it wouldn't make a difference, but six months from now, you'd be able to tell I was eating a donut a day. Um, if I smoked a cigarette for like say a year, the first six months, I might not have any anything in my lungs showing, but in a year I will. It's that little tiny thing. So yeah. I think a lot of people don't see success and they don't visually see it. You know, I always tell people like your you know, your your life will catch up to your habits. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you're making the right moves, you're moving forward, you're putting yourself in the right position, but you're not physically seeing anything yet. Yeah. Trust me, your life will catch up. So you have to adapt. The problem I think is a lot of people have limiting beliefs like, well, I'm 50 now. I don't want to start all over again. Mm -hmm. Or I worked 20 years in this career. I don't want to start over again. Like, and I think that's the wrong way to look at life. I mean, time is really man-made. I mean, yeah. whether you're, I mean, I always go back to like, you know, Ronald Reagan, president of the United States, I think at like 69 years old. Uh, yeah. Sydney, Frank, Sydney Frank created Grey Goose Vodka in his 70s. I mean, the Kentucky Fried Chicken guy was on social security when he created KFC. Like, if that's not proof enough that people can, there's no age limit. Right. It's a limiting belief. Um, but I remember it kind of reminds me like, you know, I kept putting off college and putting off college. I kept saying, oh, I'm too old. I'm too old. Then I got to like, I got to 33 years old. And I thought, well, if I do college, it's going to take me four years. Oh, I'm going to be 37 when I graduate. But I remember saying to myself, well, I'm going to be 37 anyway. Anyway. <laughs> well, why not be 37 with a degree? Right. So I, I, I think we need to just like uh, realize that, we might have to learn some new stuff. We might have to put right. ourselves in an uncomfortable position and to grow. And it's either that or fall back. And if we fall back, I mean, that's not a good way to go either. Right. You have um, you have an amazing support circle. I always see you surrounded by people. I think that are lifting you. And I and I want to just go back because you mentioned the skincare line, and people might be saying to themselves. What business does this guy have to get into skincare? And and I sort of wanted to ask you to share your mother, and she's got a successful um, spa, and you you so, yeah. My mom has been giving me facials since I was twelve. I'm actually yeah. like six years old. Look, forty six years old. Great skin, George. <laughs> yeah, and um, I actually yeah worked with my mom for a decade. We had a skincare line. My mom was actually featured on Oprah Winfrey in two thousand two. She has she was on the Oprah Winfrey show. Uh, she's one of like eight or 20, I forget what the number is, but she's one of like only two dozen spas in the entire country that's Sedesco certified, which is like the highest level of certification. Um, she learned a lot in Europe and then she brought it all to America. And the funny part is, you know, my mom opened up her first spa in 1988. Nobody had even heard of facials. They were making fun of her. Uh, and I always say, people are laughing at you. You're on the right track. But they said, are you crazy? You're going to go from being a waitress to an esthetician doing facials. Ain't nobody going to gonna do that. And so my mom, you know what she did? She put an ad in the newspaper, free facials. Wow. And women were like, oh, it's free. Why not? So they went in. They tipped her, which was great. And then mm -hmm. they loved it. And mm -hmm. at the point where at one point my mom, after being on Oprah, <laughs> she started charging $300 
for a facial. People were flying in from other states to get facials from her. So I learned a lot from that experience. Um, and that's probably why when people laughed at me when I got involved in network marketing, like, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of people that are uneducated will say it's a pyramid, it's a scam, it's this. And, um, you know, I look at it as, am I, do I want to trade places with that person who's laughing at me? And the answer 99.999% of the time is no. You know, when I got into real estate, my banker said to me, don't do it. You're going to have bed bugs. You're going to have evictions. Uh, one of my promoters for the uh, that, I, that I attend his events for my clothing told me, no, don't do it. It's a headache. Well, you know what? I'm up to like 40 homes and I'm here sitting here talking to you today. And my banker's at the desk at a job he doesn't really like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Are just canceled and he's looking to figure out what he's going to do and nothing you know, bad about that towards them. But I, Hey, I'm glad I didn't listen to them. You know? Yeah. yeah. It's so, it's so amazing listening to your inner voice versus the noise out there. And I just want to, I want to take a second for the people who are watching just to let them know at the end of this, we're going to do a Q and a. So if people have questions, they can pop them into the Facebook feed and I'm happy to uh, pull them up. If so, you can answer them. So there's a couple of things I want to talk to you about, you know, um, a lot of great leaders in the world prioritize self-discovery and learning and growth. And I swear, at least once a week or or maybe maybe twice a month, I'm seeing you throw up books that you're reading, things that you're constantly like you're constantly in the learning mode. Why is that important to you? Like, why do you make that a priority, even though you're so busy? You know, I, I'm I've realized that like you know, there's a saying that says motivation is like bathing. You have to do it every day, and I think self development is like bathing. You have to do it a lot. Uh, I, I've noticed that if I stop reading and I stop growing um, intentionally, I fall back. Like no matter how much I've learned, it's yeah. like my body goes back to what it knows. Yeah. And me to be able to study the the the, the wealthiest and the smartest and the most peaceful human beings that have ever walked the earth, whether they're alive or have been deceased, and to be able to get a glimpse of their mind and to be able to have a part of them inside my brain. Like I feel like my brain is like the accumulation of like 500 authors. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I'm taking a little bit from each person and uh, it helps me in so many ways. I mean, right now I'm reading a book by Jay Shetty, uh, Think Like a Monk. And I do study monks and I study uh, their religion uh, due to the fact that the way that they're so peaceful. These are people that have nothing materialistic, but yet have the highest gamma rays when uh, their brains are being examined. Also ha have learned how to control their breathing so that nothing affects them. And to me, that's pretty amazing that you can be happy that way. And I've learned to be happy. You know, like, yeah, I have some fancy cars, but I'll be honest with you, like, um, I'll buy something and I'll be excited for like a week. And then I'm like, okay, that's cool. I like to look at it. Like, that's not really what gives me happiness. Um, like I'm going to look at a golf cart tonight. And <laughs> yeah. And I'm so excited. I'm going to buy a golf cart. And then right wait, 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 wait. Can you tell, can you tell the folks what cars you legit have and you're going to buy a golf cart? Well, I mean, I, what I have left is I have a, a, G, a Maserati GTS. I have a Porsche, uh, a Mercedes. I'm looking at a Bentley and a Lambo right now, but I'm going to get a golf, and those those are cool. They're downstairs. I, I drive them like 200 miles a year. I just like looking at them. You know, I, know yeah. I have cars because I like cars. But yeah. when I was like 12 uh, or 13, my stepfather told me I was a loser and that I would never amount to anything. So, mm -hmm. he, like, I knew that he was no way he would have been able to afford those cars. And for me, like, you know, I, I come downstairs a lot of times. I walk out my garage. I see the cars in the garage. I do my cross because that's what we do in my Orthodox religion when we pass the church. And I'm so grateful to like God. I'm so grateful to have these. And I realize when I look at these items that like it's a reminder that I can make one bad decision in my life and lose it all. Like, and they're just reminders to make sure that I don't get lazy. You know, I always say that the easiest way to kill a crocodile is when its belly is full. And I don't ever want to have my belly full. Like, I still like I was selling the other day. Um, my real estate agent, a thief, uh, who just by the way bought a two hundred sixteen thousand um, dollar Audi R eight. 2020 the kid's 29 years old and he's uh killing it but it was and i don't want to take responsibility for it but him getting around me two years ago opened up his mind you know since i've met him i've purchased i think maybe 12 houses from him sold nine he's in network marketing with me he's flipping i mean he's he's thinking huge but he pulls he's like hey can i come buy t-shirts off you so he pulls up in his two hundred twenty thousand dollar car everybody in the gym is like what is that and then i'm in the back of my trunk in a brand new 2020 bed selling him t-shirts and the lady the next day goes, do you sell t-shirts out of the back of your car? 
And I said, well, Curtis is selling drugs out of the back of my car like I used to do years ago. Um, we'll talk about that later, maybe. Wait, was that the car that you took out and the cop pulled you over yeah. because he wanted yeah. to see it? Yes. So, um, yeah, I sell t-shirts out of the back of my car. Why? Because I don't ever want to get, like, egotistical that I'm too good to do that. Like, I don't ever want to not – look, at stay humble all so hard. I never want to – you know, I always hustle like I'm broke because, you know, what? It, it, it's though it's the habits. See, this is why, like, people fall off because what they did to get successful, what they did to lose weight or what they did to have a, you know, buying their wife, let's say, flowers once a month, whatever that habit was that got them to that point, that pivotal point, they stopped doing those habits yeah. and then they, they revert back to, like, so for me, I have to, I scare myself all the time. Like, no, you have to pretend you're broke. Like, you have to do, you know, I'm so disciplined. Like, right now I'm saving I save 10 grand a month every single month now for the last 12 months. And I have six more months to go to pay off my house. And I'm, I've been living frugally. Like I went to Kohl's and bought sneakers. Like, um, and I'm going to be honest with you, even tonight buying this golf cart, I'm like, man, do I really want to spend money on a golf cart that I'm going to drive like once a month because of COVID? But I'm not going to allow fear to stop me because I do better under pressure. Like my mm -hmm. whole life, I've been the kind of person like when I put, I remember when I bought my first $100,000 car, it was the, uh, in 2013, I bought a brand new 2014 Lexus LF something, and mm -hmm. I had just had my car that still had a loan on it, so there was a $9,000 negative equity, and I, I had all these features. The point is, my car payment was $2,200. I called my friend, I said, listen, what should I do? This car's like 98 grand. He's like, go for it. He's like, you don't party, you don't smoke, you don't do drugs, you don't spend money. He's like, go for it, it will make you hustle harder. And I'll tell you that next year, I came back in my network marketing business and I was actually a top 15 money earner because my back was against the wall. Mm -hmm. I like to put pressure on me mm -hmm. because it makes me keep moving forward. So yeah, a golf cart's not gonna make me broke, but my point is uh, I'm very like, I'm very you know frugal with what I'm doing because I have long-term goals. I'm not just thinking about instant gratification. That's why I was saying yesterday, like, hey, you know, maybe cut down some of those Starbucks and, you know, I tell people all the time, audit how much money you're spending a month and you're going to be shocked at some of the things you can cut out. Yeah. And you could you could maybe take that real estate class. Maybe you can go see somebody who's speaking like Tony Robbins. Maybe you can get that money for that down payment for your house. But people are just so caught up in the instant now, 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 mm -hmm. now, now. And they don't think about the long term. And what scares me is that I, being a landlord, I've seen all types of different people. And I believe wholeheartedly that you're going to either pay the interest now in life, or you're going to pay it. I'm sorry, you're going to pay the price now, or mm -hmm. you're going to pay the price later with a high interest rate. And what that means is you're going to you're going to allow you to not get always stuck in self gratified um, extra you know things or instant gratification. Yeah. You're going to you know you know suffer a little bit now, but mm -hmm. then in the future, at the end of your life, you're going to have an amazing life, or you're going to just Think about now, 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 and then when you get to the point where you're on Social Security and you can't ever afford a new car again, I, so I'm not going to say who, but somebody recently said to me, yeah, I'm retiring in two months. I guess, you know, I'll never be able to get a new car again. I better keep my old BMW. And I was like, wow, like that hit me like, like yeah, he's never going to get a brand new car again. He's never going to be able to get a brand new house again. Like he's stuck there. I asked him, why don't you move closer to me? He goes, no, I can't move now. Like I'm in my 60s. I, I can't buy another house. And like, mm -hmm. you know. He's going to be on a limiting. So after working from the age of 15 to 63, he has to now worry about every penny he has because he didn't make the choices that were harder. Right. You know, right. so mm -hmm. I think about that all the time. And, and I try to teach people that too. Like you got to make some hard choices now. You know, I have a friend of mine who I said, listen, man, all these Gucci belts and everything is great. But unless you have life insurance, a high credit score, and you know, you're, you're, you're owning your own house and all these things mm -hmm. that you're not really successful. You can you can show the nice car on Facebook and the Gucci belt, but what's your credit score? Like, mm -hmm. you know, what do you have in your savings account? What's your retirement plan look like? You have life insurance in case something happens and your family has, you know, and uh, he, he he listened to me. He has life insurance now, he's saving money. Like, mm -hmm. so it's but you have to have somebody, you know, push yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned fear before, and that that is something I wanted to ask you. I think a lot of times people get paralyzed by fear, and they don't they don't go for it. And I think um, I think you know you spoke a little bit to that. But like, what do you have to say to someone who's like, you know, um, I'm comfortable. It's predictable. It's it's a sure thing. Like, what do you have to say about you know, in the face of fear, going for it and not being paralyzed by it? Yeah. 
I deal with a lot of this. You know, Eric and I were just talking today. How many people are just scared to be successful? They're like, they're always looking at life as the glass half filled. Um, they're always looking for reasons why something won't work. You know, rather they'll give you like 10 reasons why something won't work, but they won't give you one reason why it will work. And I just think it's a habit. It's the, it's the way that that person's processing their thoughts. If you, that person probably never reads any books. That person probably watches no self-help uh, videos. They've probably never been to one event to better their lives. They probably, the average of the five people they hang out with, I guarantee you are probably exactly financially where they're at. Mm -hmm. Um, they probably have a lot of negativity in their life and they've, you know, I can't say how many people like will go, well, I was going to do business with you, but then I Googled this and I saw there was this, you know, um, I, you know, I was, I was part of a company once where they had a lawsuit and this guy's like, well, I'm not joining your business because there's a lawsuit. And I'm like, well, just so you know, the Google that you use to look that up, they're being sued too. Like everybody's been like every fortune 500 companies been sued. I'm about to sue somebody for putting in the wrong bathtub in my bathroom. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. what's the they just, they're looking for a reason. Oh, Google said this. Or, oh, my broke Uncle Harry said that it won't work. So I needed that validation. Like they're all, they're, they're looking for that negative validation so that they don't succeed. Um, it's tough. It's mindset though. Like, I mean, I've done a lot of Tony Robbins and Landmark to get my mind in the right space. So like, how do you keep your mindset? Is it just like you recognize, cause I'm sure you've had some darkness and oh, yeah. From that, you know, you've catapulted yourself, but how do you keep your mindset in a good place that keeps you going forward? Like I said, this is why I read a lot. Um, yeah. That's why I read a lot. That's why I, I have a weekly meeting every week with uh, my most influential business partners. Nice. Uh, we, make, we make ourselves accountable. We forget about the rest of the world for an hour and focus on the positivity in our lives. I remind myself a lot too to, to look at what I'm grateful for. Uh, not what I'm lacking. I remind myself that my biggest problem that I have today, somebody else that maybe wishes they had that problem, you know, somebody in another country or somebody who's physically not able to do what I do would be, would give anything for that problem, you know? Um, you know, I mean, and the fact that like, you know, for me, like, I, you know, I know like my birth date, but I don't know when, when this, this expiration date is going to be over. And the fact that I don't know you know, I just can't sit back and, and, and not do the best I can. I feel like I've been given the gift of life. And yeah, I'm not going to be perfect all the time. I have my moments where, listen, I have moments too where I want to take a nap because I'm not feeling good. Or I don't want to get up in the morning or I'm having a bad day. I just don't live in those moments as long as everybody else. Or I just push through with them. Yeah, you know, like there's things on my mind right now that I'm dealing with. I mean, this has been a really challenging year for me because I'm not a person who should sit at home alone a lot. I, I need oh. to be out. And you know, I was engaged, um, and that relationship ended in November. And then, just as soon as I started to to grasp that in March, all of a sudden, COVID hits. You know, so i me living alone. It's the first time I've lived alone in six years. And then on top of that, you have COVID. Um, and so, yeah, I have my moments too. But I, I have to con continually remind myself, like, energy flows where attention goes. What do I want to focus on? Do I want to focus on uh, the, the the problems in my life or, or the solutions in my life? And um, I'm just gonna, I just keep pushing through. And I, you know, I was talking about this the other day, I was saying how I, I can only imagine what people are going through right now. But again, perception is reality, right? It's, that's just the reality. You know, if you, you know, you can, you can convince your mind of anything you wanted to convince. I mean, I see guys in the gym today that are like 120 pounds soaking wet, but the way they walk around, the confidence they have, I don't know what mirror they got, but I need that mirror because <laughs> they're like 200, 200 pounds Jack He-Man. And I'm like, you know, because hey, you 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 got a good perception, <laughs> and maybe you're not 200 pounds, he man, but in your mind you are, and that's your yes. reality. You're happy. Yes. Perception is reality. I so appreciated that that authentic video that you threw up about being alone during COVID because I could relate to that. I mean, it's been extremely lonely. It's been and and I'm an introvert, so at first I was in my glory. I was like, this is great. I don't have to deal with people. But then it started to hit me and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm so lonely. So it was really raw and real of you to throw that up and just be like, I'm realizing that I'm alone and it sucks. I like to share like my thoughts and, and sometimes, uh, I mean, I used to be very private, but I'm realizing after I wrote my book, I put everything out there that, you know, when I don't share my my weaknesses, I, I seem in, uh, unhuman. I, people used to joke around, say I was a machine. My friends would say, you must have wires that you plug into the outlet because I don't know how you do what you do. Um, but I am human. I have feelings too. I mean, and I'm just like everybody else, but I just choose to be, I just choose to be different. I choose to be different and it's a choice. And I just have this, you know, desire to be the best I can be. I 
respect my grandmother who's passed so much that for her taking uh, custody of me when I was three, and I realized like she gave up a lot of her life to watch me in her 50s. Mm -hmm. She didn't have to do that. And now for me not to be the best version of myself would be like a disgrace to her and my last name. And to me, I have more respect for somebody who's not even alive. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, even if I don't believe in myself, I do it for her. You know, she's all my phone. I mean, mm -hmm. right there, they're holding me when I was, they adopted me when I was three. Like it's a constant reminder. So I have values. I have values. Yeah, yeah. Values and I have standards of the way I want to conduct my life. And like I said, I'm not going to be perfect. You know, I'm not. You know, I'm, yes, I'm a humanitarian. Yes, I help a lot of people. But I'm sure there's a lot of there's a couple ex girlfriends that probably think I'm a devil if you ask them. So you know what I mean? Like, uh, <laughs> so that so that leads me to my next question, and that's something that I have been admiring you about that you're always extending yourself and you always want to help people, and you're always. Like I think um, a good example of that is how you help people with their credit. So uh, talk to me about why that's so important to you to turn around and like help the guy who needs a hand. You know, like I, I most of my life I was I would say I was broke or low income or struggling mentally, um, financially. So now to be put in a position where I've been graced and uh, with such amazing opportunities, um, I feel like. You know, it's my position. I mean, I have the trophies, I have the money, the cars. Like, I feel like it'd be a, a, an injustice to life if I didn't try to share. And not everybody wants it, though. I mean, I, I there's people that I try to help, and they don't want to be helped, uh, or they want to be helped for a week, or they quit on me. But you know, I don't allow other people's behaviors to affect my inner peace. So if I'm going to be somebody who helps people, even if they quit on me, I'm going to continue to still help people. But it's just important to me because I know it's a great feeling when you see somebody change their zip code. Or you see somebody change their situation. You know, going into I went to um, a few drug rehabs and spoke in 2018 or 19, and I was invited there to speak, and it was amazing because uh, most of these men that were in these uh, drug rehabs had ruined their credit because when they were on um, drug addiction, they weren't really thinking about how paying their bills, and then for them to know, like, wait a minute, you know, there's hope. I could, you can fix my credit. You can actually help me improve when I get out. Um, and a lot of them will reach out to me. Um, I go into some of these prison facilities and I speak to these guys and I let them realize like, you know, I was broke. I had nothing. I lost my house. I lost everything. I mean, I was arrested in 2008 for uh, making bad choices. Um, and I was zero. I mean, I had nothing in my life. I know what it's like to twice in my life not have anywhere to live. I slept in my Jeep when I was 19. Um, so it is important to me. I feel like that's my calling. I feel like, you know, we're really important. Uh, they're very powerful. Like I can tell somebody I love them. I can start a war with just words. So uh, that's just what I want to do. It's in my heart. And um, I try my best to, to make sure I give a, a, a large part of myself to other people. Um, and just like when you asked me to do the interview, you know, like today's um, Monday. It's a crazy day. But to me, I see what you're trying to do in your life. <clears throat> and I value that you're trying to help people. and you know, I'm going to say yeah to most things. I mean, there are some times where I have to say no to certain things because if I say yes to everything, then there has to be a no somewhere else. So, you know, and, and the no usually comes to because I get a lot of people that like message me really long messages and it gets really difficult sometimes. But my sure. goal is always to respond. Like yesterday, somebody sent me a message that long and I was in the middle of looking at a wholesale deal and I just wrote back, can't read this right now. But I let them know yeah. that I all the book come through, <laughs> uh, which reminds me, I have to go check, see what that was all about. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, it's, I, 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 you know, I always say like when you, when you die, there's like your start date of your life and the, the death date of your life. There's a little hyphen in between and the hyphen to me, that little line signifies your entire life of what you did. And I just want to make sure that when I die, a few people look at my tombstone and go, Hey, that person helped me or that person helped my dad. And, you know, they say, Statistically speaking, like if it rains on your funeral, 50% um, of the people won't show up and only 10% 10, 10 will actually cry. So I'm trying to change uh, that number. I want at least 75% people to come to see me die when I die um, and maybe 20% cry. You know what I mean? That would be a lot to me. I went to my friend's funeral three weeks ago. He uh, unfortunately uh, passed away. Um, I won't get into what happened, but seeing him in the coffin, you know, we, when he was 22, I was 23. When I met him, we hit it off instantly and he passed at 44. And if I would have told him at 22, half your life is over, you know, neither of us would have believed it. But watching, seeing him in the coffin was like, 
it was really hard. And I remember thinking, man, like no matter how good of a person I am, no matter how much I do, like that day is coming for me too. I can't escape it. And a lot of times I think we forget that. And I remember I visually like for a moment saw myself in the coffin right. and who was going to be at my funeral. And, um, you know, life is, life is, life is beautiful, but it also ends, you know, it comes to an end. There's an expiration date on all of us. So, you know, there's something that we share that's in common and that is, um, our passion for wanting to help youth. And I know that you um, were getting into some schools. I've done some public speaking in schools. I created a children's program for, for kids to, to help them understand what it means to have a healthy mind and a healthy body. Um, and there's something really rich about uh, getting the impact that you can have on a child's life. Could you share with everyone, like you got a message the other day, right? Yeah, yeah. So. You know, like I, I've been able to coach adults. Adults are the hardest to change their their mindset because they're already programmed, right? <clears throat> so, so I'm noticing that kids are still impressionable and they're still able to be molded. So we go into high schools and we speak to them about our past and how to and, and our the future. You know, I remember there was a young lady who messaged me after I spoke and she's like, you know, I was thinking about suicide. I thought maybe I should end my life, but then I heard you speak, and then your your childhood was very similar to mine. And now you're a happy adult. And I never really thought, well, maybe I can be a happy adult. But it was Friday night. I was eating dinner. Um, and all of a sudden, this message comes through out of nowhere. And it was actually like in like a separate like request thing on my Instagram because I wasn't friends with uh, with uh, the, the student. And the message just basically said, I was like a 16-year-old a girl. She said, hey, um, you spoke at my school a year ago. Do you still help people when they're sad and depressed? And um, it just... I'm getting emotional right now because I remember being that age and I used to hate my life so much. You know, I thought the world was ending and like all I knew was that moment. I didn't ever think about life in the future, but it made me, it made my heart drop. I thought, man, like imagine like, I wish I would have had somebody when I was 16, I could have reached out to. And I knew for a fact, there was no way that I couldn't help her. So I basically, you know, the, the issue was, uh, there was a couple of issues, but one of the major issues was she was dating a young boy who, um, broke up with her and then he told everybody that she sent him like, you know, photos and people were like saying that, you know, she did this and although she didn't do it, they believed him and she was getting like made fun of. And and I, I basically, you know, I, I, I use a lot of self-development on her and explaining to her how these people aren't happy with themselves, like what they're doing it, how they're not going to be important to her in a year or two when she's out of school. And I went through like the knowledge and these are things that she's never heard, like a 16 year old kid has never heard self-development or heard different angles of life you know like when you're sitting there and somebody's making fun of you you're not thinking well that person's unhappy you're not right. thinking well, that person won't be in my life in a year you're not thinking those things so when you bring the reality of the situation to the attention of a kid they see it totally different and by the end of the conversation which took 15 minutes of me making some audios to her she's like you're absolutely right you know i'm not gonna allow them to bother me i'm gonna ignore them like they don't mean anything to me their opinion doesn't matter and I felt like, wow, I just had a breakthrough with this kid. And um, it was a great feeling. You know, it was a really, really great feeling. <clears throat> and um, I can only, you know, and, and the, the interesting part is a lot of these kids won't talk to their own parents, but they'll talk to a complete stranger. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, I mean, I want to do more of that. You know, COVID definitely put a, a, a halt to that. Right. Uh, one of my friends yesterday did a, a Zoom meeting in a school, but it wasn't the same. He said, right. it didn't, you know, it wasn't the same energy as being in front of these kids. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was around. I have like five thousand like high school Instagram uh, friends nice. uh, that are high school kids. I'm like, you know what? I should run for mayor in like four years, and they all graduate. Yeah. I win. <laughs> you probably would. <laughs> That's amazing, though. I mean, just the fact that she felt comfortable enough to reach out for support. I mean, I think we need more kids to have those people, those those uh, people that they look up to, that they do want to reach out to. So. That's amazing. It's really, I, I love that story so much. Um, so I guess before we start to wrap up, uh, we don't have any questions. So if folks have any, uh, I'm sure they'll, they'll post them. But before, before we close, I want to just ask you, there's a lot of people um, who I, I like to leave people with some inspiration or some, some, a different thought that maybe they haven't had. So you know, COVID is, has taken a lot of jobs, has uh, even in some cases um, been the cause of a, a breakup in a relationship. There's been a lot of change that has happened this year because of this pandemic. And there's a lot of people who are want to just bury their head in the sand and say, I just want to forget this year is over. Is it January yet? What words of wisdom or advice could you give people who feel like 
you know, the year has destroyed them and they're hopeless and there's nothing, and there's nothing to do. What advice do you have for that person? It's a, it, that's a good question. It's, um, I have a friend of mine who is going through depression right now because he lost his job. He's behind on his rent. And I tried to have a conversation with him at the gym, like, hey, you know, look on the bright side. Like, you know, you look great. You still have your youth. Like, and he was like, it's easy for you to say you have that big backyard and all. And he went off on me, like, you know, and um, he's like, you know, you, you own your books. Those books are written by guys that make money. And I was like, whoa. And I let him talk and mm -hmm. I let him 20 minutes just like give it to me, you know. And um, I didn't take it personal because I realized when people are like that, they're in pain and they're just pouring their pain onto me. Like, that's not, I don't have to retaliate because I should be either, I should be at peace with myself, not to understand that. So he apologized though that night, he actually sent me a, a long message saying, I shouldn't have done that. You know, I'm, I, I should be grateful that you even asked how I'm feeling because nobody else cares about me. Um, but I understand a lot of people have that mentality. And what I need people to understand is like, you know, I'm in a better position, let's say than most. Now mm -hmm. it's all relative. Like, I'm still losing money. I'm still um, not in the same energy space I was. I can be honest with you. I don't feel the same I did prior to COVID. But because I made multiple streams of income choices, because I put myself in positive environments, because I took my life and I tried to put it in a certain place, I'm not as effect affected as bad. So what I tell people now is, you know, you can't expect this is never going to happen again. COVID could happen again. There could be a new COVID. There could be um, some laws that change, but th this is not the last time in our lifetime that we're going to see something happen. The economy could tank again. Um, so you need to start now to put yourself in a position and make what I, I'm what I consider is launch a campaign yeah. in your own mind, a campaign to do things differently this time around yeah. so that when the next time this happens, you're like, Oh, okay. A little bit hit me a little bit, but I'm fine. Right. This is why I'm paying my house off. I was thinking about paying it off prior to COVID, but now I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go from having a mortgage payment to the, for the rest of my life. I won't have a mortgage payment if ever, if ever this ever happens again. Let's say all my tenants don't pay me rent and I foreclose. All I have is a small tax bill every month on this beautiful home. I can get somebody to live here with me to pay just to pay that. Like I'm thinking, what am what am I doing now? So if this ever happens again. Mm -hmm. and why I didn't buy a fancy car yet. I'm waiting to pay my house off to see where I'm at in April. It's not that I can't afford it, but it's all about making smart choices and being patient. So, I mean, what I tell people is stop feeling sorry for yourself. You know, stop being a victim. You just, you got to stop. I mean, every day you have a choice to, to, to create a new, a new thought, which will create a new feeling, which will create a new action, which will create a new result. If you're listening to me right now and you're breathing and you're alive, you know, there's people that are in the same position you are that are going to come out doing great. So what's the difference? It's you. You have to, you have to take control of your life, and you have to be willing to maybe uh, be a little more humble, put the ego aside from what you've done in the past and how successful you were, and you know, 20 years of this and that, and say, hey, you know what? This is a challenge. I mean, I believe that you're not giving any more in life than you can handle, and you have to make a decision. Dig deep down your soul and say, you know what, I'm going to come back because every setback is a setup for a comeback. And mm -hmm. if you set up this comeback, I can promise you, you'll never be in this position again. And and if you are, you know what, like people say, you know, why you always read books? Well, you can take everything from me. Like right now, you can literally take my cars, my house, my bank account. But guess what I have that you can't take away? The knowledge and experience that I have. And this is the reason why people are successful because people that quit don't ever go through the lessons. Like the yeah. As soon as it gets tough, they quit. Successful people, as soon as it gets tough, like COVID, they adapt. They find other ways to make money. They find, you know, I, I don't care right now if I had to, if I had to drive an Uber, if I had to like work out Walmart, I would do whatever it took right now if I had to. You know, yeah. but I don't actually do credit repair. I own the company, but I said to my guys every day, like, if I lost everything today, I would actually get in the trenches with you guys and I would do credit repair because I see the kind of money you can make and how you can still be your own boss. Like I don't need to do it right now, but trust me, I tell you, I have no problem doing it if I had to because my brain is a little wired differently. You know, like yeah. um, I have attention deficit disorder. So, like, you know, it's a little more like doing credit repair. Like, you, you have to be focused on the computer for a little while. And uh -huh. I, I see how they're doing the consultations on the phone with people. And I'm at a point where I don't know if I can listen to somebody's for 20 minutes to tell me why their credit's bad. Mm -hmm. And like, I would be crazy. Yeah. So, don't get me wrong, though. I would do whatever I had to do to make it happen, believing that. Sometimes you got to go back in life to do better. You know, how did I get to this point today? Like, how do I own, you know, three and a half million dollars of real estate when I was homeless in 2008 and 1995? Like, how, so there was a setback. 
Man. that got ready for a comeback. So I'm not expecting people to watch this video and their life's going to change, but think about some of the stuff that we talked about today and just understand that every day is a new day. Every day is a new day. And what was that that you said? You said, choose a different thought, create yeah. a different feeling. When you have a new thought, like right now, if I was like, you know what? I really want to start bowling. Okay. <laughs> and I'd be like, Oh, so now I have a thought, right? So now I'm creating a new feeling. Like I'm excited about bowling. I'm picturing me scoring a 300, right? So what do I do? I go down to like the bowling store. I get a bowling ball. I got my bowling shoes. All of a sudden I went from like sitting here to becoming a bowler. And then, <laughs> right? And then I sign up for like the bowling lane. And now I'm practicing and practicing. And then six months from now, I'm shooting like a 300 bowling score. And I'm like, whoa, how? Because new thought created a new feeling. New feeling created a new action. The action eventually creates a result. Right. Brilliant. That was so succinct. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I think on that note, we don't have any questions. So um, thank you so much. Unless you have any final words that you want to share. And I do want people to catch your uh, contact information if they want to sure. read. So um, Instagram is probably the easiest way to get a hold of me because I'm like maxed out on Facebook. But I mean, on Facebook, you can send me a request. If you look really positive, I'll find somebody negative. I'll delete them because <laughs> I'm maxed out of 5,000 friends. But I'm George K. Power on Facebook, um, the underscore GK project on Instagram. Um, and that's probably the best way to get a hold of me if you're interested in learning more about real estate, credit repair, network marketing, uh, writing a book, whatever I can help with. Um, and as far as my only advice is like, if somebody's watching this and you're in a dark place, you know, tie, tie a rope, tie a knot, hold on. Uh, better days are coming forward and uh, you know, just take it day by day. Um, try to focus on what you have that's positive in your life. Try to focus on what you're grateful for. Um, ask yourself, you know, uh, instead of, you know, why is this happening to me? Ask yourself, what's the message here? You know, what is the message? I remember um, Inky Johnson had an example of a guy who was, um, he was wearing like a new suit and tie and he was in a coffee shop and somebody spilled coffee on his shirt and he was in the bathroom and he was so angry. He was cleaning his shirt. Like, I can't believe my brand new shirt and tie got coffee on it. So then he's like, you know, he wipes it all up and then he's walking to his job, which was in the World Trade Center and the building blows up and everybody in his office died except for him because he got coffee spilled on his shirt. So sometimes you have to ask yourself, like, why am I being redirected? Like, what's the purpose of this going on? Like, for me, like, why was I being redirected in this year? What's the, what's the, what's the reason for the redirection? How do I find that? And how do I find myself? You know, a lot of times you find out your true self in a chaotic moment and chaos. You know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna grow in harmony all the time. There has to be some chaos. You know, when you get to the top of the mountain, uh, there's nothing grows on top of a mountain. That's why you got to come back down the valley again to see growth. So just uh, take it day by day, stay positive. Um, it's not going to be easy at times, um, but I've been there, guys. I've been to the point where I've been broke. I've been homeless. In 2006, I put a gun to my head thinking maybe I should just pull the trigger because I was so unhappy. And who knew that in 2020, I'd be on an interview with Michelle talking about positivity. Like, yeah, right. But I couldn't see, I couldn't see that at the time, you know? I mean, I was literally like, I just wanted to feel what it felt like to put it to my head to see if I could have the guts to do it. And I, uh, thankfully, I didn't have the guts to do it. Right. But I remember I was just going through so much. I was, um, you know, taking a lot of performance enhancement drugs uh, for bodybuilding. I had been diagnosed with an arterial venous malformation. The, uh, the, the, the doctor told me there was a 5% chance I would die during the surgery. Um, I pretty much had to drop out of college because I, I was losing my memory because of the arterial venous malformation. I couldn't compete in bodybuilding. And then again, I was dealing, I was taking a lot of, you know, mind altering drugs that were changing my mind. And um, I still in 2006 was probably still dealing with like my childhood in my life. And I was in a dark place, but thankfully, like I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And you know what? Here I am today. And I can't guarantee that I'm always going to be in a positive place, but you know what? All I can do is try my best to stay positive. Excellent. Wow. Thank you so much, George. Thanks for sharing all the wisdom that you did. I really um, appreciate everything that you shared. Thanks for being vulnerable. Thanks for being who you are. I love following you. And I think um, I think a lot of people appreciate just who you are as a human being. So thank you. Thanks so much. Have a Thanks. great day. Take care. Bye-bye.